So it just turned uh, one o'clock, and I would like to uh, to welcome you uh, all to uh, to this uh, webinar. My name is uh, Carsten Schmidt. I'm Director General of uh, the Danish Utility Regulator, uh, and uh, it's at uh, at our institution that that we published uh, this uh, anthology on uh, on energy regulation in the green transition, which this webinar uh, also is uh, is about uh, today. We published it uh, last week, uh, and it can be found at uh, at our web page. And uh, there's a, a link in the chat uh, to uh, to see the the book. Uh, I'll uh, just uh, start with a short uh, intro, and then uh, I would like to, after that, give the word to uh, to our moderators for for today. I'll just come back to uh, with a short introduction of uh, Leonardo, who is our moderator uh, this uh, this afternoon. And before that, I'd like to just uh, share a, a couple of um, uh, of slides uh, with you. Um, I don't know if you don't, probably don't see it yet. Uh, they're just about to be there. Now we can see it. And I just have to turn on my video again. So I think uh, the slide should be there, and uh, I should be there too uh, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we published uh, this anthology uh, last week on energy regulation in green uh, transition. We did, did that uh, to better understand the interdependence between uh, regulation and uh, green transition. Uh, and uh, and there's two sub goals with, uh, with that. One of them is to avoid barriers and challenges in the regulation uh, in the name of green uh, transition with this uh, political wish for for uh, for green transition but also to uh, to ensure uh, in the best possible way also to meet uh, economic efficiency in uh, the green transition and the cost that is connected with green uh, transition so with that uh, um, Foundation, we uh, uh, try to uh, to facilitate uh, interaction between academics and uh, and regulators to to better uh, understand uh, which challenges challenges there is in regulation in uh, in green transition, and that's actually uh, the whole meaning with the, with this anthology to uh, actually to better understand and be able also to uh, develop regulation. Uh, to ensure a cost-efficient green transition and to ensure that regulation do not hinder uh, uh, the transformation in the green transition uh, too. So in, uh, in a lot of different uh, articles in this uh, anthology, there's some new regulatory thinking uh, and, uh, and hopefully it will... Uh, enhance uh, and encourage uh, the dialogue and reflection between uh, academics and regulators in, uh, in the coming uh, time. Uh, to, to make this uh, anthology uh, happen, we had an editorial team. Uh, and beside my, myself, there's a lot of uh, good looking professors, as, uh, as you can see from, uh, from this uh, <coughs> slide, there's uh, Birgit Olsen, from uh, Aarhus uh, University, a, a professor in law at uh, Aarhus University, Henrik Lund, uh, also a professor, uh, he's a professor in energy planning at uh, Aalborg University, uh, Peter Mølgaard, who you will uh, meet in a uh, short time. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, persons that will uh, present uh, uh, shortly after me. He's a uh, dean at uh, Maastricht uh, University School of Business and uh, Economics. And then uh, Tuarch uh, Yamasp, who is uh, uh, presently a professor at, uh, uh, and, uh, of Energy Economics and director for Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. So it's, it's a, a, a couple of uh, wise persons that we uh, managed to, uh, to cooperate with and, uh, and help us uh, choose uh, issues and authors, authors for, for this uh, anthology. Uh, the anthology consists of three pillars. Uh, one about uh, national monopoly, uh, monopoly uh, regulation and tariff design. 
one about governance and uh, legal aspects, and the last one is about mm -hmm. uh, investment decisions and uh, frameworks. There's a, a wide range of, uh, of different issues in uh, each of these three pillars. Uh, as you can see in the, in the first pillar of uh, natural monopoly regulation <coughs> and tariff design, there's issues about uh, energy network innovation, uh, about uh, price efficiency, green transition uh, channels for uh, regulating natural monopolies, uh, there's consumer uh, ownership, uh, and there's uh, issues about electricity tariff designs uh, too. So just in this uh, one pillar, there is a wide range of, uh, of uh, uh, different issues. The same goes with governance and legal aspects, uh, which uh, contains articles on, uh, on the income uh, cap regulation of the uh, Danish uh, power supply sector. There is uh, a chapter about uh, regulatory experimentation in the energy or uh, sandbox, it's, it's also referred to uh, sometimes. And then uh, the last chapter on that uh, pillar is uh, acceptance or maybe not, uh, not acceptance uh, issues in, uh, in the transition to <laughs> renewable uh, energy. Uh, issues in the uh, investment uh, decision goes to uh, uh, around uh, uh, issues on, uh, on uh, discounting uh, uh, different uh, aspects in the in green transition. The first one is about net present value in CO2 reduction, and uh, the last chapter is about uh, discounting in, and, uh, and the green uh, transition. So a lot of different uh, issues in the anthology that uh, hopefully we in the coming time will be able to, to, uh, to work with in the, the development of uh, economic uh, regulation. And that's uh, actually all from, uh, from me in this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and I would like to, to give the floor to uh, Leonardo uh, Mios. Uh, he's uh, our moderator, as, uh, as I mentioned. He's also a, a professor at the Florence School of uh, Regulation and professor and partner at the Florid Business School in, uh, in Brussels. So, uh, so thanks for moderating this. Uh, this uh, webinar, uh, Leonardo, and now give the floor to you. Thanks. Thank you, Karsten. Uh, thank you for the introduction and also for this really great initiative. And uh, on behalf of Florence School of Regulation, uh, you know, very well, very happy to co-organize this together with you, um, the Danish utility regulator, and also with our friends in Copenhagen uh, from the Copenhagen uh, uh, Energy uh, Infrastructure School. So. Um, really happy to be here. We have four speakers. And before we dive in to the speakers, um, let me just remind you that everything is org around, organized around this book, right? You have the PDF file in the chat. It's an open source book. So that's really great. And that's why today you are getting a bit of a teaser of this book. Um, also, you can already start to ask questions. Um, we have a bit of time after every presentation to take your questions. You know we have this Q&A box and the chat box. Um, and it can, we can pick them up immediately after a presentation or uh, towards the end if you have questions that are maybe can be picked up by, by several of the speakers. I also remind you that we are live recorded, right? So, um, you know, so that you take that into account. Um, um, that's it. So let's just start. Uh, first speaker is Peter. Uh, Karsten already introduced Peter as one of the editors of the book. He also has a link with Florence because I saw he did his PhD uh, in, in, uh, at the EUI a while ago. <laughs> um, and he is currently the Dean of the Maastricht University School of Business and Economics. He's also the chairman of the Danish Council uh, on Climate Change. So I think he's perfectly a position to introduce us to why energy regulation is so important in the green uh, transition. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And, and before I, I start presenting, uh, let me just, uh, on behalf of the editorial team, thank uh, the director of the Danish Utility Regulator, Carsten Smith, for, for having the vision to, to uh, make this anthology uh, uh, a reality. <coughs> uh, it, it, or have the vision first, and then actually making it reality. And also thank uh, thanks to the uh, to the backup team at the, at the Danish Utility Regulator who has really worked hard to to make this uh, a success. 
so it's so uh, thank you very much. I think I speak uh, both on on behalf of, of all the editorial team, but also the, co the contributors. We have really been well supported in this, and it's a very fine product that has come out of it. <laughs> So let me uh, start sort of by sharing my screen. And I, I thought it would be too boring just to uh, to go through the an uh, anthology. So I'm going to do a bit um, what professors uh, often do and assume that you have read the book, read the anthology, and then I'll do something uh, that, that that takes us sort of in a, in a fly in from a planetary view. And then I'm going to focus more and more, uh, zoom in on, on, the, uh, on the book. Uh, so it will be there uh, eventually. But let me start uh, sharing my slide in just a second. And here we go. And in a second, we'll be in presentation mode. I hope. There we go. Can you all see that? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. perfect. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this is where I want to go. Um, and this is the, the, the zooming in um, from a planetary view uh, on, the, on the need for a green transition. Uh, then I'm going to zoom in, zoom in on what a small country like Denmark can do, um, and uh, to to um, and, and we I think we have a sp spectacular case there, and that's why I want to um, to to dwell a little bit on that. Uh, and then I want to very briefly discuss the anthology and the and the dilemmas that have, that we have outlined and, and try to resolve in different ways in the different chapters, and then in some with some recommendations for, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions regulation. Um, <laughs> Uh, coming from the Danish Council on Climate Change. So let's, uh, let's move from Florence, uh, from Copenhagen, from Maastricht to Paris. Uh, of course, that is where we uh, have the current ambition that governs global um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And why, are we going on, why do we want to reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emissions? Well, that is to try to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius, and actually to pursue efforts to limit temperature increases to only 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, compared with pre-industrial levels. And that's just, that, that is not uh, easy. Uh, and, it, and, and the reason why we want to do that, of course, is uh, that if we get a, a way above two, uh, two degrees, then the world as we know it might well change. It is already changing. And we also um, know from, from the Paris Agreement that developed countries, uh, country parties should continue to take a lead in this um, and to, to continue to enhance mitigation efforts. Now, with that uh, in mind, and, and we, we, we can see how, how's it then going. And if you look at, um, at the, um, where, where we are currently heading, you can see that on the, on the red curve here. So the, the red curve shows a business as usual uh, scenario. Uh, and what is needed, <laughs> well, it, it doesn't matter, but, much, but I think the uh, the uh, I'm, I'm afraid we haven't really translated the uh, the uh, legend to the vertical uh, scale here. But it's uh, gigatons CO2 equivalents per year. Um, what is needed is that we go with the blue or the green line, and so the Paris uh, target requires very steep reductions. Uh, the difference between the two curves is the degree of overshoot in, in, in uh, temperature. If we go with the rapid uh, decline in greenhouse gas emissions on the green line, then we don't have a lot of overshoot. And then we can also uh, allow the curve to flatten out. If we allow overshoot, so if we delay the reductions, as you can see in the blue line, then we actually uh, will uh, we'll have to go way below um, zero in emissions uh, by 2020. 2050. So, so that's the challenge, and that's where we need to, to contribute, uh, all of us, and that's why also the, the regulation of this area is so uh, important. What we have received recently is a great support from the European Union in terms of the European Green Deal. Um, again, it establishes uh, uh, an ambition to be net zero emitter of greenhouse gas in 2050. Uh, as uh, many countries now have on uh, around the world. Uh, and it is also uh, uh, in a very welcome move seen from a Danish perspective, 
increased the 2030 target from 40 to 55%. Uh, and that's really important because now we're getting an, an ambition in, in Europe, which is uh, more in line with the Paris uh, Treaty or the Paris Agreement uh, than, than, than before. And what, of course, we, um, we are expecting this uh, year is uh, a presentation of um, uh, a revision of most climate and energy policies, um, the Fit for the 55, uh, fit, fit for 55 package. Now, let me try then uh, to, to talk about something which is very close to my heart and also very close to my role as a chair of the Danish Council on Climate Change. And that is the Danish climate targets. And it is I'll relate it later to the, uh, to the regulatory aspects, but, but you can say in a sense, it is a regulatory uh, policy, but, but not just not one that has much to do with the utilities, at least not from an immediate perspective. So um, last year, we got a new climate act in Denmark. Um, so uh, in, in June, 2020, we got, uh, passed through parliament in Denmark, a, a climate act with a very, very wide support. I think there was only one party on the far right that didn't support this um, act. So almost all um, members of parliament voted in favor of, of, of this act, which is important because that means that we have at least a, a very broad political support for this. Um, there are many aspects of the, of the act and I can easily get carried away with this uh, act but um, among other things, uh, it has set one of the most ambitious um, greenhouse gas reduction targets in the world. So basically, at least certainly in the developed world. Um, so we are aiming in Denmark for a 70% reduction uh, of greenhouse gases by 2030 compared with 1990 levels. That's the usual base year to, for comparison. And we want to be uh, net uh, zero emitters by uh, 2050 at the latest. Now that is right now, you could say, in, as we're speaking, we, we have managed to reduce in um, by 38% um, since 1990, which is already quite an achievement, uh, also in international comparisons. Um, but well, that also means that we have managed to reduce by 38% in 30 years, 31 years, um, and now we aim to reduce by another 32 percent percentage points in 10 years. That is a, a, a very steep um, reduction curve. So that is what we are aiming at uh, and, and, and working for in the Danish uh, Council on Climate Change. What we are doing uh, there, are, we, have, we have three roles. Uh, we, we have a watchdog role that we... Uh, um, you could say that we, we have to, uh, and it's established by law, that we have to monitor the adequacy of the government's climate policy. I'll get back to that in a second, how we, we think of that uh, as of now. We also are uh, an advisor uh, to the government, so we provide science-based policy recommendations uh, to the uh, Danish government, to parliament, and to, to society. And we also have the role of a convener so that we engage stakeholders uh, now uh, since the new act we do that even more systematically than we have before because it's established by law that we have to talk with 41 of our prime stakeholders before we publish uh, our uh, main reports now here is an, an attempt at um, summarizing what we have spent nine months on uh, Undoing, and and that is basically um, the. It came out a month ago, a new report, uh, and there's a. Um, um, it's a it's 150 pages in Danish. If you don't read Danish, you can um, you can um, read the summary chapter in English, um, and it basically is very systematic in its assessment of the adequacy of the Danish government's uh, climate policy. <clears throat> And what we came out with and then made, made a bit of a splash uh, a month ago was that the um, our, our initial conclusion is that uh, as we speak, government policies are not adequate. And essentially the uh, government has, um, and you can see that, you can see the, the ambition to reduce, um, um, you can see how, 
how many million tons of CO2 equivalents we have, uh, we have uh, currently. And with, with the current already, um, or, or with the climate policy, with, with the frozen policy um, uh, scenario, we would reach 44% uh, in 2030. <clears throat> the frozen policy being uh, established uh, before last uh, June. Now, in order to reach, re achieve the 70% target, we would have to end up uh, with, this, with the uh, broken line here. So we need to reduce uh, by a, around 20 million tons CO2 equivalents to achieve that target. What the government has um, uh, achieved is uh, adopted measures for legal agreements on seven out of those 20 million tons. And that corresponds to roughly one third of, of what they need. Um, they have also established, and that's all the way to the right in the graph, um, technical potentials. And technical potentials are especially carbon capture and storage and power to X technologies. Those are represented by the, uh, by the boxes on the right. And what you can see there, and that's, uh, is that first of all, there are two levels. They have a high and low uh, potential. Uh, and if they achieve the high potential in all um, in, in all of the remainder of or in all these technical potentials, then then they will be home safe. But we say that they have not made any of this concrete. There is not an analysis. There is not a strategy. There is not a political proposal that would lead us to believe that they can achieve this uh, by 2030. So, for that reason, we have said that currently the the policy is uh, not. Um, uh, showing adequacy. Now I'm trying to link it more and more to the um, um, to the uh, well to the energy sector and in, in particular to se so sector integration. I think that's extremely extremely uh, important. Also, for what, we, what we talk about today is that we have a holistic view on society that we look at, about sector coupling and uh, and and think in systems. So. Part of regulation should make sure that we are not um, making silos but breaking silos. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, in the baseline in 2030, now in the baseline pr prediction for 2030 from the Danish Energy Agency, we will have 48 terawatt hours of renewable energy in um, 2030 with a share of 111% uh, of demand in Denmark. Now, this is, again, the baseline before we have um, adopted any new policies. Um, so the, this low estimate constitutes a scenario where a wide variety of policies are adopted to, to reduce emissions, not only electrification, but also energy efficiency and carbon capture and storage. Um, when you look at the high uh, estimate in this figure, that constitutes a scenario where the policies to reduce emissions are highly focused on electrification and where power to X plays a major role. Um, an example of uh, the difference between uh, low and high is from the transportation sector, where low uh, equals around 0.8 million more electrical cars uh, or 800,000 uh, electrical cars by 2030, and high equals 1.2 million additional electric cars by 2030. And I'm not going to go into to deeply into this, uh, but um, uh, it's important to state that uh, while power to X will play some role, the high numbers presented here in the high scenario comes from the government's climate program. And these uh, numbers do not ex exclude overlap. Uh, of reductions from power to X with, with other measures. Um, so in our recent report, a status report, we have recently uh, judged the high estimate for power to X uh, related uh, greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 to be highly uncertain. And therefore we deem that the high scenario to, uh, high scenario electricity consumption from power to X uh, seen in this figure is unlikely uh, as, as we speak. Um, 
let me move on and then get closer to the um, closer to the book, um, the anthology project, which I think is really fascinating. Um, for there we go. Let me quote uh, from uh, from page five in the book. Uh, I think I could. I, I was thinking if I could, I could improve of the text, but I can't. So I'm uh, quoting from uh, from the, uh, section one one of the anthology, which says that uh, the green transition has far-reaching implications for all sectors of the economy, and they're perhaps more, most visible in the energy sector. The confluence of a technology technological shift, increasing efforts to couple energy and related sectors and the presence of organized markets and natural monopolies create a unique set of challenges. Re regulating energy utilities, electricity, gas, and district heating in the context of a highly ambitious green transition consequently poses a series of important and unresolved issues, not only in Denmark, but also in the European Union and, and uh, in the international society. So let's unquote uh, what I think some of the dilemmas that we are dealing with in this book um, are listed here. So we need maybe to go from cost efficiency, from an efficient regulation to cost effectiveness, to think about how do we get most, most you could say, uh, user benefits, but also user benefits enhanced, enhanced with climate um, effects uh, into the equation here. How can we incentivize innovation, but uh, without uh, creating stranded assets? We are talking about a fundamental transformation of society. So how can we avoid the stranded assets? And uh, maybe they are not, uh, I think in certain industries, they will not be uh, avoidable. So what do we do with that? Um, you can see that, say that technological uncertainty creates uh, the risk of locking in effects, lock in effects, um, and that's also to be taken into account. And then uh, last, but definitely not least, and I think that takes us a little bit back to Paris also, and, and the Yellow Vests, um, uh, that, that we need to have a social acceptance of this whole thing, but also of new energy infrastructure. And that's not um, trivial uh, that we get that. There will be resistance, also public resistance, to, to many of the effects that we're talking about. And that is something that I think we need to, th to think into the transition and that regulators also have to think about. So there are three th themes in this uh, first an an anthology and I really look forward um, to, um, to following um, the second and, and, and third edition here on the next couple of years. Uh, regulation and tariff design is very important in order to be able to um, electrify sectors that are currently running on fossil fuels. Um, that could, for example, be transportation through electric vehicles or manufacturing of hydrogen via electrolyzers to use hydrogen in, um, in industrial processes. Uh, with the right tariffs, this could, should, should become easier. Government, governance and legal aspects. In order to achieve this electrification, the utilities need the right regulation that will allow them to invest in appropriate amounts of capacity in the distribution system. How do you can create a transparent way of allowing higher capital expenditure? More broadly, do we need to redefine the framework of governing the utilities, given the challenges, opportunities, and changes uh, resolving from the green transition? And investments, of course, uh, are an important issue given that the energy sector investments need to double to 3.5 trillion US dollars each year from now to 2050 to just achieve the two degree scenario of the Paris Agreement. Um, how do we create the framework to make uh, the best investments? Uh, a lot of calculations and assumptions go into uh, investment decisions, so the investment de decision framework is hugely important. And with that, I will. Uh, I want to end with a few recommendations. On uh, do I have a minute more, Leonardo? I can see that you're unmuting. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> <short>. okay. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, just conscious of your signal. I want to. Uh, I, 
I have I have something that I always say, almost always in any speech right now uh, that I give, and that is um, that greenhouse gas emissions need to be more costly than they are today. And here you can see how uh, a picture from Denmark, and it's uh, in a sense highly stylized, of course. Um, but outside of energy regulation, an even broader debate is going on with regards to pricing of uh, CO2 or CO2 equivalents. Um, what we are suggesting in, uh, in Denmark is that to have an efficient, cost efficient green transition in Denmark to achieve the, the highly ambitious 70% target in 2030, we should have a um, the same tax on all uh, greenhouse gases across all sectors. And it needs to be um, at a level such that we can achieve the 2030 target. And if that happens, then we can have the market push towards the, um, the, the, uh, the um, the 70% target. And that would basically mean that we have uh, to phase in a, a general greenhouse gas in Denmark on top of, um, of, of um, the ETS system that would reach a level in 2030 of 200, roughly 200 euros per ton CO2. That's a, that's a big increase compared with where we are today. It's, I think, uh, it's roughly seven doubling the, the, the current CO2 uh, price. But that would be one of um, uh, our, that is our, in effect our main recommendation for the um, green transition. There are, there are details of that that I could get into. I think I will, for the sake of time, not do that. Uh, the, you have to avoid uh, the leakage that the fact that we're, that if we do that unilaterally in Denmark, we do, might just um, the, the CO2 emissions might might just leak to other countries, neighboring countries, and that would not be good for climate. We have a way of dealing with that. That would have been on my next slide, but I think I'll skip that because uh, otherwise I get lost in uh, many details and maybe go. Um, oh no, I just came back on line to me. No, okay. Maybe uh, we should mute when we're not um, speaking. Um, what um, I want to end with uh, uh, a number of energy specific recommendations from the Danish Council on Climate Change that we have, um, we have five recommendations to, to the um, use of green uh, energy. Uh, we want to, and, and that has been picked up by the government in a big way already, we want to have more uh, windmills in Denmark and, and right now they're discussing um, two, two uh, wind, wind energy islands uh, in, in the North Sea and in, in by Bonholm. And they, they will have a, um, uh, the capacity if they get, if and when they get up and running of, um, uh, supplying what is equivalent to 10 million households in Europe. That's way more than we have in Denmark. So of course, some of that energy should also go into, for example, uh, power to X. But that means that we need to uh, build more um, um, well, wind windmills, uh, these energy islands. And then also, um, as I said, we need some infrastructure to, to deal with that. And one of the things that we have experienced is that there will be increased uh, public resistance to, to, to the energy infrastructure. So maybe that's, uh, and for that reason, we need to, um, to have a more flexible uh, way of looking at complaints in relation to wind and solar projects. And that is something that uh, could slow down these projects quite significantly. Of course, the transmission and distribution network planning should be based on, on Paris compatible scenarios so that we think that the rest of the world will also invest in different ways to achieve that. Um, we need to have a new model for compensating affected citizens in relation to transmission lines. Um, I can tell you they're not happy with, uh, with the transmission lines in, in uh, at least parts of Denmark. And we need to develop a strategy for energy storage and energy demand, uh, demand response, the flexibility that we need, need to have all that renewable energy in the system and last but not least, uh, transmission and distribution tariffs and uh, fees should be flexible to reflect, for example, capacity issues. 
Let me finish here, uh, speaking from Maastricht, so which is some, some, somewhere halfway between Florence and Copenhagen. I think, roughly speaking, that's not too, too geographically imprecise. Um, I'll now hand over uh, to Leonardo again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, uh, for giving us the big picture, both on the challenges we face and also um, the scope of the current book, right? And already looking forward to the uh, new editions. One of these challenges you already introduced was on incentivizing innovation and, you know, how to do that without uh, having uh, stranded assets or lock-in. So I think this is the topic Manuel pick, will pick up. So Manuel is a postdoc researcher um, at the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. He originates from Spain. He did his uh, economics degree there, PhD, then to the UK, then to Copenhagen. So as you can see, not only Peter here is among the international bunch, <laughs> uh, but Manuel definitely also um, has done his tour of Europe. Uh, Manuel, please present us um, your chapter. Many thanks for the nice introduction, Leonardo, and let me share my slides. Can you see the slides? Perfect, go ahead. Many thanks. Uh, thank you again to Leonardo for the nice introduction. Um, um, one thing I, I would like to say, uh, to mention in the beginning is that um, initially this talk uh, uh, was, was going to be uh, uh, given by, by Tura Jamaz, who is also one of the, is the director of the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure and also one of the editors of this uh, um, of this book, of the, this anthology. But unfortunately, he cannot be uh, with us today. So I'm doing this, let's say, on uh, his behalf and also on behalf of uh, Leonardo and, and, and team, uh, who are also co-authors of this, of this chapter. And I hope to do a, a good job. <laughs> um, in this chapter, basically, we, uh, we try to analyze uh, diverse uh, economic reasons that can hamper innovation in energy networks and we discuss possible answers to incentivize and motivate innovative activities in the in this uh, regulated sector. Um, I would like to start uh, highlighting again that the uh, European Green Deal uh, it encompasses uh, a series of policies to achieve the objective of making Europe uh, the first climate neutral continent by 2050, as Peter has uh, mentioned uh, before. Um, so. Um, the commitment to, to reach full decarbonization uh, target by 2050 uh, has already been demonstrated by certain actions, um, such as, for instance, the TYDP network development plans and the development of the of the of these the scenarios at uh, European level. Um, these scenarios are jointly developed by the European network of transmission uh, system operators for gas and electricity, and represent an effort to describe the interactions between the these uh, energy sectors. And, evalu and evaluate the development of new infrastructures to reach a full decarbonized energy system in, in the future. Um, the growing share of renewables uh, connected to the grid, along with the increase in the interactions between gas and electricity, and also with other uh, sectors, such as, for instance, uh, transportation, um, apart from other uh, challenges, uh, will likely define an, an integrated energy system that will uh, need to be efficient uh, resilient, reliable, and environmentally uh, sustainable. Uh, the current level of uh, interlinkage between these sectors is uh, still limited, but it is expected to increase in the next years and, and decades. Uh, so that um, the development of new technologies will be key to effectively uh, implementing the green transition towards an environmentally sustainable society. However, we cannot achieve the decarbonization targets by only relying on the existing technologies and solutions. So we need to develop new solutions through uh, innovation. According to the, to the OECD, and you can see the definition in the, in the screen, an innovation is the implementation of new or uh, significant improved product, uh, which means a good or service or process, uh, a new marketing method or a new organi organizational method in business uh, practices, workplace organizations, or external relations. Um, in general, investments in energy networks uh, innovation uh, have been relatively uh, limited in the past, 
And this is mainly due to the um, capital intensive nature uh, of this infrastructure that exhibits natural monopoly characteristics, uh, which results from high economies of scale uh, um, relative to, to the market size. Uh, after the liberalization of the of this sector, uh, the unbundling of the of the activities uh, implied the vertical separation of the sector into competitive and regulated segments. Uh, the focus uh, in the regulated energy networks has primarily been on improving the cost efficiency, and hence the uh, regulatory economic framework does not seem to have provided uh, enough incentives to invest um, in innovation. However, as I have already mentioned, uh, innovation efforts by energy networks are crucial for the energy transition. And in order to promote and increase the effectiveness of uh, innovation in the sector, the economic, regulatory, technical, and policy aspects and the interactions need to be analyzed and better uh, understood. Um, here we have tried to describe some key uh, economic aspects to understand the relevance of innovation and to explore its uh, slow pace in energy networks. Uh, this table uh, summarizes some of the concepts that we think are relevant to analyze the topic and its possible implications. First, um, endogenous growth theory establishes that economic growth is mainly driven by technological change. And this is characterized by a three-step process that includes invention, innovation, and diffusion. And so the impact of economic growth uh, seems to justify a public role to promote uh, R&D efforts. The second point is the, um, the value regarding the value of death in innovation is that the transition from invention to commercial application is not always as smooth. And there is quite often uh, a gap uh, usually known as the value of death in innovation. And the prevalence of this problem uh, calls for a particular focus on the widespread application of uh, innovations. Of, uh, of invention, sorry. Um, third, um, R&D has some characteristics of a public good, and this uh, may lead to market failures. In our opinion, this evidences the need for promoting open innovation and collaborative uh, R&D uh, and innovation efforts. Uh, fourth, uh, traditionally, the energy sector has been seen as a, a provider of public uh, serve of a public service. However, the perception of energy has gradually changed uh, to a service of increasing value to the users uh, due to the growing demand for energy services. Um, this increasing impact seems to require the adoption of a value-based approach when evaluate innovation funding. Um, fifth, um, is the banding of the energy sector has likely implied a loss of economies of, of coordination. In general, significant R&D efforts are more likely uh, for, uh, for large organizations. Since firm size could be a constraint uh, for R&D expenditure, the coordination to organize large R&D projects could be a possible response uh, to this issue. And, and, and sixth, uh, finally, um, uh, initially the main objective of the energy sector reforms was the improvement of uh, cost efficiency. And this has resulted in a limited focus on other aspects uh, and reductions in R&D to achieve some term, short term goals. So another uh, possible implication could be to increase the emphasis on outputs and incentive base rather than cost efficiency uh, regulation. Um, addressing the, the issues that we have just seen uh, requires solutions that are not, uh, that shouldn't be considered in isolation, but in a broad uh, perspective. In our opinion, this, these features uh, invite for an energy R&D infrastructure ecosystem established through uh, collective and interactive efforts uh, to facilitate the development of new uh, innovative ideas and value creation. And this will likely imply changes in the current business and regulatory uh, models. Um, innovation and R&D in the energy sector is a complex uh, activity and involves different types of factors with uh, energy networks utilities being only one of these uh, one of these actors uh, due to the high costs and range of uh, innovation efforts some companies are involved in r d externally to share risks with other companies and reduce uh, uncertainty uh, in addition uh, conservation and dissemination of generated knowledge in innovation is, is very important 
energy R&D is costly and valuable. Uh, however, much of the results are not uh, well known by the scientific uh, community. And this seems to call for developing incentive mechanisms and responsibilities for the retention and dissemination of generated knowledge. Um, this aspect has not received enough attention because the financial and scientific benefits to research, uh, these are limited. Um, again, uh, the, the high cost of energy infrastructure, along with the lack of knowledge preservation, can be used as arguments to encourage organizational and collaborative research for energy and uh, networks. Uh, the loss of institutional memory can be an important problem for many organizations. And although much knowledge remains in individual scientists and engineers, this can be moved to other areas of, the, of these organizations or even to other organizations. So this highlights the relevance of establishing knowledge transfer uh, processes in the organizational culture of research centers and the energy firms uh, themselves. Here in this slide, we provide a quite general uh, overview of possible regulatory mechanisms uh, to stimulate innovation. We define three input-based uh, regulatory mechanisms that are utilized to facilitate uh, expenditure on R&D and innovation. We additionally include uh, competition for funding and uh, output-based uh, method. The first is a, a regulatory asset-based uh, approach um, to innovation expenditure, which simply includes uh, R&D and innovation spending in the regulatory uh, asset base of the of the utility. However, the issue that follows is how to how this uh, this regulatory asset base is to be remunerated. In in, in Great Britain, uh, it is applied to infrastructure projects and uh, discussed for new uh, nuclear um, projects. The second option is a weighted average uh, cost of capital based approach. Um, and, and this type of approach can attempt to distinguish uh, between the capital and innovation or innovative assets and other forms of capital in the form of investment in more uh, conventional assets. Uh, the objective is to increase uh, the return on investment to fairly uh, reflect the higher risk of innovation investments. And in Italy, uh, some smart grid projects uh, receive additional uh, weighted average cost of capital. Um, these two previous approaches assume that innovation spending is uh, capital expenditure, but on the contrary, uh, a cost pass through uh, approach to spending on innovation implies that spending on R&D and innovation is a current expenditure funded by the, um, by the rate payers and, and hence the regulated entity does not receive any rate of return on these expenses. Uh, in Norway, uh, DSOs, uh, R&D uh, expenditures are added to uh, allowed uh, revenues. In addition to this, uh, there is also the possibility of a hybrid solution, such as a competition-based uh, uh, mechanism for funding the best uh, projects. An example is uh, Ofgem's uh, Low Carbon uh, Network Fund. And finally, as uh, some um, innovation benefits can go uh, beyond grid cost reduction, some regulators uh, complement uh, input-based with output-based mechanisms. And basically, uh, um, improving the relevant outputs can foster innovation as a means to gaining uh, rewards. And uh, this is my, my final, final slide. So as a summary, and based on the previous features we have seen, uh, we propose, uh, we mentioned some, some options that could be helpful to promote research and innovation in the European context of energy networks. Um, as uh, we have mentioned before, uh, the economic regulation in European energy networks has traditionally been focused on short-term cost efficiency improvements. And it seems that innovation has not been explicitly promoted to the same level. So given that innovation can be costly and imply a significant efficiency gains in the long term, the first proposal uh, is the application of regulatory models that stimulate innovation and adopt long-term goals, either through input-oriented or output-oriented uh, incentive schemes. And it is also important that these uh, regulatory mechanisms consider the risk profile on innovation to prevent utilities to be focused only on low-risk normal efficiency improvements. 
another possibility could be the application of funding um, models such as Ofgem's uh, low carbon network fund, as I mentioned before, where utilities compete uh, for funding to develop uh, innovative projects. And in this type of mechanisms, utilities allocate a part of the revenue to a collective innovation fund, and they get involved in a competitive process to get funding for undertaking the most promising uh, innovation projects. And finally, to guarantee the preservation and dissemination of knowledge in innovation, an idea that could be worth to, to explore is the establishment of a European research hub, similarly, uh, similar perhaps to uh, EPRI in the US or CREPI in Japan. And we think that the new uh, energy innovation uh, um, ecology could be helpful to inspire collective and uh, interactive efforts that facilitate the development of, of new innovative uh, solutions. So such collaborative approach could compensate for the decreasing economies of coordination from the unbundling of the of the energy sector. And that's uh, I think that's all from my side. <laughs> Many thanks. Perfect. Uh... Thank you, Manuel. So the chat box is starting to be active. Let me already maybe pick up two of the three questions now. And the third one, I, I think, is uh, more appropriate after the next speakers. But the one from Jasper, I think, connects um, clearly with Peter's presentation. Um, so he's asking about why, if we talk about CO2 emissions, are we so focused on the operational aspect? Um, and are we paying enough attention to the assets? So when we invest in assets, how they are produced and the CO2 you know, contained in that process, is that properly taken into account? So I'll ask Peter to answer that one. And I'll also ask um, Manuel to answer the question of uh, Martin, who has the feeling that we already have all the technologies we need, at least the technologies that we expect utilities um, to, to deploy. Is that true? Or um, do you still think we do need some new technologies um, and that it, we do not necessarily have everything already? So maybe first go to Peter and then to Manuel. And it's a super good question by Jesper. Uh, I think um, we should uh, take assets into account, uh, especially when we are building new assets. Uh, it can be different, difficult to, to, uh, to change, although not entirely impossible to change the uh, carbon uh, emissions or the greenhouse gas emissions from existing infrastructure, but for new infrastructure, certainly we should have a life cycle uh, approach to think about the the uh, the carbon footprint. And I think that is becoming more and more uh, uh, the case. Uh, for example, when we talk about building infrastructure, and I'm just making, uh, I know that it, it might be not what you're thinking of, but, but if you think about uh, the building infrastructure, we have uh, we can do something about the energy efficiency of um, of existing uh, buildings, of course, but new buildings, we have the possibility of uh, thinking uh, through the entire um, um, supply chain, uh, thinking about the carbon footprint of uh, of the concrete we use, of the uh, uh, but uh, but also so so I, I could give more examples of that. But we really think through the entire supply chain. But also think about the the, the future use until uh, um, uh, you could think almost a cradle to cradle uh, kind of uh, thinking for for uh, infrastructure as well. So I think it's a very valid point. We need to think about the the entire um, uh, life cycle of uh, of infrastructure as well. Thank you. It's, it's increasingly being done, but but not sufficiently, I guess. I, I hope you uh, put Jasper, you know, a bit at ease that it is being looked at. Uh, Manuel, do we need new technology or is it enough to deploy the existing <laughs> technology? Um, it could be. I mean, I'm, I'm only an economist, so I'm, a, I'm not a technology expert. So it is possible that maybe uh, we have seen most of the technologies uh, that will be needed to reach uh, full decarbonization by 2050. Um, but uh, the point of the, the, the point of argument normally is that uh, um, one thing is that, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the, there is this three, this three um, um, step um, um, technological change process and we, we have uh, invention, innovation and diffusion. So even if uh, 
certain technologies have been, have been invented and we have seen some examples of how they, uh, how they can work or how they can potentially work and we can have some simulations looking at how they interact and, and what would be the potential achievements. Then the, there is the issue of the of the deployment, as you already um, implicitly mentioned in your, in your question, Leo. So um, in that case, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, it's important that the economic, uh, regulatory, and policy aspects are are well in place to to allow that uh, these uh, technologies, which might be existing already at this moment, but they are fully deployed and and and, um, and they work uh, towards the, the the objective. We saw in the in the presentation from Peter that uh, for the case of Denmark, some of the of the goals uh, have been um, we have we are seeing some progress in these uh, um, objectives of decarbonization, but still there is a long way. So that means that if these technologies are already there. We need to do something else to try to, to, to see them in place and again, uh, reach the, the objectives for 2030 and 2050. Thank you for clarifying, Manuel. Let's go to the next speaker. So just like Manuel, we have another modern international researcher, uh, this time starting from Belgium, little detour to Madrid, to Paris, a bit in the US and now landed in Florence. Also a senior researcher, engineer slash economist, Tim, please give us the intro to your chapter. Thanks a lot for uh, the introduction, Leo. So I'm, I'm gonna share my, my slides. Okay. So you should see them now. Um, yes. so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the, the chapter we wrote jointly. Um, so with Leonardo, with Torash and with Manuel. On, on regulatory experimentation in energy. And we're gonna look at three pioneering countries and we're gonna, and we also discuss on, on how to, to look ahead, what to learn from these experiences and, and how to go forward with this in the green uh, transition. So first, um, where do we situate uh, regulatory experimentation among uh, the other tools to do, um, to, to, to foster or regulatory tools to foster innovation? So a classic tool to foster innovation, especially for, for network companies, uh, as already discussed by, by Manuel, is, is incentive regulation, competition for, for grants or, or output regulation. So that is covered in another chapter. Another uh, traditional tool of the regulator to, to stimulate innovation, and this is mostly the case for um, market-based or, or let's say for market players has been uh, waivers. So waivers are narrowly defined uh, exemptions that are granted for strictly defined activities and types of actors. So an example of that is uh, balanced responsibility for renewables. So when renewables enter the, the energy markets, uh, letting them be balanced responsible, so to be financially responsible, for, for example, forecast errors, was seen as too much of a risk and would therefore uh, stop their entry into market or at least uh, make their, their, let's say, uh, business case more, more, more difficult. So therefore, this was this waiver. But then, of course, when uh, renewables matured, the waiver could be lifted or, or could be removed, and therefore, they became balanced responsible. Now, regulatory experimentation, what we talk about in, in this chapter, is, is a third way, and it's a more of a, a new way to, to foster innovation. Um, regulatory experimentation, sometimes it's often also called a dynamic regulation. I think it's called like that in the CER uh, working paper, the Council of European Energy Regulators. So what is what we mean by regulatory experimentation, because we, we make that definition, there is no existing uh, definition, at, at least not that, that we are aware of, is that it's a tailored temporal removal of, of a regulatory barrier uh, it could be a real der derogation of a rule or assigning responsibilities to players to perform non-traditional activities. So what is the difference with a waiver? Because you could say it's more or less the same thing. Well, the difference with a waiver is once you give a waiver, the idea is that at some point you remove it again because the rule has to stay in place, like balanced responsibility. And with regulatory experimentation, it's really about learning how whether this rule which might have been justified in, a, in, let's say, in the past or in the, in, the, in the current situation, becomes an unjustified barrier for, for a future with new technologies and new kind of relations. So therefore, it's really about the learnings about whether that rule, that regulatory rule, should be adjusted 
or removed or, or just kept in place because in the end an outcome of an experiment could also be that uh, it's good to keep things as, as they are. And regulatory experimentation um, can be applied to both both regulatory uh, to regulated such as network companies and and market parties. So why is regulatory experimentation extremely important today? Is that it's it's maybe common to say, but we are moving faster than ever, and it's not so obvious to adjust regulation at the same pace of innovation. So therefore, this type of experimentation can be a way to um, to not have to wait for a regulatory review, which could take longer time. And in the meantime, have some kind of, let's say, experience in order then to know how exactly adjust uh, permanently certain regulation. So how did we go forward in, in that research? Because now we only have a definition and a positioning of regulatory experimentation. Well, we looked at what is actually going on uh, in, the, in the European Union. And uh, we found out, at least from the information that, that we found, um, that there are three countries, or there were three countries, which are pioneering this type of, um, let's say, a new regulatory approach, which is Italy, the Netherlands, and, and Great Britain. But the way that they are implementing their regulatory experiments or, or regulatory experimentation is quite different. So in this research, we, we actually um, compared the, the three implementations in these, these countries along six dimensions. So the details of these six dimensions um, and the kind of the trade-offs and the pro and the cons, they are, they are described in, in the chapter. Um, but, but here I can give you a, a brief overview of, of what actually happened in these, in these different countries. So in Italy, it was mainly really the regulator, uh, a regulator-led experimentation where they designed so-called uh, regulatory pilots. They did several of them. A, a, a very nice example is that in 2010, they, they set up an experiment because they didn't really know with uh, these electrical vehicles coming, um, who should actually build and operate these uh, electrical vehicle charging stations at that time. So therefore, they tested out different options. Should the DSO do it? Should a market party do it? Uh, should there be competition in a region? Should there be competition between retailers at a certain charging point? So they tested out in total three uh, business models for three to four years, and then they, they draw their uh, conclusions. So in this case, it were very much targeted derogations because in the end, the derogation was actually assigning responsibility to an actor which normally does not do this type of job, in this case, uh, the DSO. Um, it took three or four years, as I said. It was very strong, the regulator who was in charge in terms of designing it, uh, monitoring it, evaluating it. There was also some funding involved. Uh, the different uh, pilots or regulatory pilots, they, they did receive uh, some funding, not complete funding, but some funding through general uh, the tariffs. And very importantly, every six months, this was really followed up with reports, what is going good, what is going bad, the statistics. And in the end, there was a final public report. And also very good practices that actually the Italian regulators published some academic papers on this, which is also helpful for us researchers then to document these, these things. In the Netherlands, it was quite different. It was very specific, two types of actors who could engage into regulatory experimentation communities and, and homeowner associations. Examples were um, trials with new types of tariffs, um, a new actor um, operating its own grid in its local community, uh, exemption from certain supplier licenses. And actually what the, in Netherlands happens was the ministry who had this decree of experimentation with, with, with regulation, and it provided um, a sort of a list of a menu of options, like, please, if you apply for this regulatory experiment, here are the, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 articles, which you can ask a derogation from. And then you pick out of the menu uh, the derogations you want. And then, you, of course, you discuss with the ministry or the regulator who was also involved on whether this is feasible or not. So this is a very much of a different way of doing regulatory experimentation. In GB, so the last country, uh, they really implemented what is popularly to, um, talked about as a regulatory sandbox, which is really, it is very much open in who can come. In this case, there were communities up to multinational companies such as ADF who applied for a regulatory experiment. Examples were, uh, of course, tariff designs, peer-to-peer -peer trading, 
again, exemptions from supplier license to so all kinds of activities which are actually not feasible under the current regulation. And what Ofgem did, did was just saying, okay, here are the two, and this, this is in the first case where I think two regulations of which you can ask any uh, derogation that you want, but then we have to discuss with, with us, with the regulator, and if we think it is reasonable what you ask for, then we will grant you that derogation for, for two years. So it was really open. So um, also in, in the case of, of GB, there were, there's a lot of dissemination about it. But of course, as some of these experiments were, were actually commercial, uh, not all um, parameters or, or let's say outcomes were then shared with, with the public because there is a trade-off between being transparent and then uh, not having an issue with, uh, let's say, the business case uh, being, being used by, by other um, competitors. Now, after we did this research, we quickly realized that there were also many other countries which were implementing their own uh, regulatory sandbox or their regulatory um, experimentation, such as Austria, Belgium, France, Slovenia, and probably many others. They all have very funny names, like in Austria, it's the Energy Freiroom. In Belgium, it's, I, I forgot about it, but it's also something like Lawless Area or something, Leonardo knows. And in France, it's Baca Sable, which is the French uh, literal translation of sandbox. In Slovenian, I don't know. Uh, so then after this first wave, um, which actually involved mostly low voltage electricity projects, such as energy communities, retailers, DSOs, active consumers, and so on, these three countries, which were actually quite happy with, with what happened, um, kind of expanded their regulatory experiments. So there was a second wave, we call it in the paper, where the size and the scope of the project, so more types of actors could apply for an experiment. And also importantly, uh, more and more gas and low pressure gas projects were, were taking into consideration. So you could, then in Italy, there was a regulatory pilot about gas. In the Netherlands, they also wanted to, to include uh, the gas law to be exempt from. And in GB, it was always open for a low pressure gas project, but actually it was not so popular. So they tried to, to also promote it a bit, especially with the eye on, on, on sector integration. Now, um, currently these national implementations of regulatory uh, experimentation, they focus on areas which are under EU directives. So EU directives, they literally give a country a direction to go towards. Um, so therefore there is a bit of room of national, let's say freedom to implement. But some innovations which we might expect or some kind of uh, trials we need might also happen at high voltage or high pressure levels. And these ones, they fall under EU regulation. And EU regulation is harder to play with. It's more, let's say, hard-coded regulation. Um, there is some experimentation happening in the form of um, pre predefined or embedded exemption procedures. There's a kind of experiments with, um, experience with interconnectors. So traditionally, interconnectors are built by TSOs, regulated entities, but under certain exemptions, it could be market parties who also build interconnectors. And there's also an experiments with, uh, bat experience with batteries and EV charging stations. So the clean energy package decided that batteries and EV charging stations should be built by the market. But if the market does not come, a regulated party can, can build and own, uh, operate these, these assets. So in the conclusion paper for the Bridge Beyond 2020 by Acer and Sear, they mentioned, which was published two years ago, they mentioned that we need this EU umbrella for, for the sandbox approach. But they did not really go into details of what they actually mean by that. So in, in, the, in the conclusion of the paper, we write that actually uh, other countries could learn from our six-dimension framework and, and, the current, and the implementations. But also at European level, we might um, learn from these national experiences and transpose them to a European level. We could extend the list of exemptions, such as in the Netherlands. We could have some EU pilots, such as in Italy, or we could have an EU-wide uh, regulatory sandbox. But that would mean that we need a sort of an involvement of an EU actor, which could be the ACER. And we could go from guidelines to really strong monitoring of these uh, European experiments which is a bit of a, a trade-off between regulatory specialization and, and, and coordination effort, because of course, these, 
these pilots and monitoring these pilots, they require a lot of effort and they require a lot of specialization from, from the regulators because it's, it's quite heavy, especially the more intense you go in terms of uh, experimentation. So this is it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tim. And I'm keeping track of the questions, but I think it's better we first um, take the last presentation. Also because it's nice, the transition from the CER Acer paper <laughs> to Anagret. Uh, Anagret is heading not only the International Relations Department at Bundesnetzagentur, she's also the president of CER. So <laughs> I'm sure she knows uh, the paper that Tim was referring to. <laughs> Anagret, your role is to sort of comment on the book, what you've heard so far. Far and also maybe give us some open questions that you might want the next book to address. <laughs> Go ahead, Anagrad. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, not only the book is interesting, but also our discussion that we have here so far. And uh, therefore, um, I haven't prepared slides, but I have uh, a lot of comments and uh, also um, yeah, remarks. And of course, I was listening very intentively to uh, Tim about dynamic regulation. And um, yeah, maybe I can indeed start uh, with uh, what is dynamic regulation in the next We First, uh, we have uh, just uh, last week uh, published a consultation document on the CR strategy on energy transition. And indeed, we are um, also addressing issues which are addressed in the book. So how can energy regulation uh, be uh, promoting uh, the um, energy transition? Uh, with a particular focus on, and that we should not forget uh, on the uh, en energy consumers because all of this uh, should not happen for the sake of happening but uh, uh, in the end also uh, benefit uh, the consumer. I'll, I'll get back to, to this uh, broader concept uh, in a moment. Uh, in the next few days, we will also publish a short uh, notice uh, about dynamic regulation, which is one of the Ds of our current 3D strategy, SCR, uh, and uh, that relates to dynamic regulation, and uh, we understand it a bit more comprehensively. Uh, not only the experimental uh, regulation, which was uh, highlighted uh, just uh, by, by Tim and with, with which we agree. And I can assure you, we will, we will have a table which is a little bit longer from more uh, NRAs that now try these uh, regulatory sandboxes or whatever you call them in the different languages. Uh, and uh, But we also see that um, there, there are other, let's say, more uh, classical instruments, which we would also call dynamic regulation, like incentive regulation, uh, which, of course, also uh, um, in, in implicitly uh, addresses uh, innovation uh, issues uh, and uh, provides incentives. And to be even to go even further the, and understand the term uh, dynamic regulation in a, in a broad sense, we would say that it encompasses uh, the fact that regulation needs to become uh, also, let's say, more flexible uh, and uh, more comprehensively in the comprehensive in the sense that uh, the system, the energy system uh, gets uh, more complicated. And so regulate, and there are more actors involved uh, with more roles, with more interaction. And so therefore, uh, and we have more targets. We have the sustainability target now or net zero or whatever you call it, Paris uh, climate uh, target, uh, EU climate uh, target by 2050. And uh, all of this uh, gives the regulator much more responsibilities. And that means regulation must take this into account and become what we call multidimensional and take into account that, this, that the regulation is not any longer a command and control uh, issue, uh, but is something uh, that, um, let's say, is, is more um, 
dynamic in the sense of interacting and of taking into account the impact it has and target this uh, to on the different or to the different um, uh, actors and as i said we have not only the operators which of course are the still the basis and uh, some principles of course also do not go away uh, it is clear that uh, networks uh, are um, natural monopolies here uh, and uh, that requires uh, regulation but as i said uh, certainly uh, incentive regulation or output based regulation with a quality or, or performance based regulation uh, with, a, with a quality element so indeed if you want to call this moving from cost efficiency to cost effectiveness i'm happy to do this uh, and i wouldn't see any um, let's say uh, contradiction here uh, it is just let's say um, evolving and modernizing if you like uh, um, uh, network uh, regulation and that of course also includes we haven't touched upon this so much uh, on the other side the question of the tariff design the network uh, tariffs uh, which also need to take into account that the inner energy system as a whole becomes more flexible and uh, this requires of course that the um, uh, tariffs uh, provide uh, more uh, are more um, uh, in uh, um, have more differentiated time differentiation uh, to provide the right signals in terms uh, of providing flexibility uh, or of uh, taking out uh, active and with this i also come immediately to to an important new or new players a uh, player uh, this is on the one side the consumer or the empowered consumer and by this we really and we, we put this in the focus of our strategy and i want to stress this uh, that uh, we let's say want to to empower the consumer and that means that he can benefit uh, and be part of the energy transition so that it is not only the passive old rate payer uh, model uh, or uh, but that the consumer it's, uh, himself or herself is active uh, and um, is, is also being provided incentives uh, to participate actively in the market and one of those incentives of course is a, 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 a uh, for example dynamic uh, uh, contracts or uh, what I had said already um, tariffs uh, um, time based uh, or time differentiated uh, tariffs etc so that the consumer also uh, feeds into the system and is both at the same time very often uh, um, a consumer but also a producer those the, with the term of, of the the, uh, the co uh, con co producer and consumer at, at one one uh, in one go so the important part here is to see to see all this as a whole system approach as a whole system consumer centric or consumer oriented uh, approach taking into account the interactions between operators uh, and uh, consumers and others like uh, for example uh, also uh, new um, players like aggregators uh, like um, uh, energy communities uh, in, in, in the future more and more and I think that is uh, important here to uh, in order for this system to work um, you need to define uh, the the roles uh, ex ante of all players uh, in, 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 in to ensure also a level playing field because otherwise I think the, the system uh, will not uh, deliver the benefits to all participants and in this sense then we will also not be able to reap the benefits uh, of an integrated uh, energy uh, system uh, providing uh, and, and pushing energy transition. So clearly regulators see themselves uh, as uh, promoters of the energy transition of using their responsibilities and their increased tools, uh, the, the toolbox, in a, in, a, in a responsible way to promote uh, the, the energy transition uh, with all the uh, uh, targets that I mentioned already. Uh, and of course, the, the challenge will be to, to find the right balance between this um, dynamic regulation, between this aspect uh, of, uh, react, of, of, not, uh, of, of um, interacting, so to speak, with the system, but of course, uh, still holding uh, the, the, the pen in the regulation, so to speak. Uh, and uh, on the other side, also 
uh, of, of ensuring predictability of the system necessary for long-term investment. So uh, dynamic regulation doesn't mean anything goes, but it is still a principle-based regulation in a specific uh, set uh, with a wider understanding or with a more comprehensive uh, approach. And I think that is uh, uh, important here uh, for us to recall. Uh, that means, of course, as I said, that the regulation gets more, um, not more complicated, uh, but more multidimensional, and we need uh, to balance this out uh, and uh, find uh, the right timing. And this, of course, is something, let's say, that is always difficult for a regulator not to regulate too early, but also not to lack behind. So if we want to steer the markets and the system in the direction that I just outlined towards the targets, uh, we must ensure that we monitor the developments closely and find the right moment uh, to intervene uh, and to set, uh, or, or not to intervene, uh, like in the sense of uh, having a, um, a, a regulatory sandbox, uh, and, and uh, so not to, to distort the process, but to ensure that we support the market uh, processes and the, the process of the, of the system that on, on the other side is still based on a natural monopoly. So I think that is also uh, important here uh, to recall, and I think that is also uh, mentioned uh, very uh, and outlined very well in, in, in one of the articles uh, that I liked uh, very much about uh, that uh, the regulation uh, is, uh, um, is, is uh, part of, of, the, of the system, uh, uh, but that there are also uh, other um, players that the governance need uh, to uh, take this into account, like, for example, the idea of having consumer-owned uh, distribution system operators. I think that is a very interesting um, concept that is described there. Um, I guess there are some open questions uh, whether it can function uh, in practice, given that um, the consumers also move around. They are not always staying there at the same place. Uh, and I guess these are issues which uh, I don't say uh, require a second book, but require further thinking. I think it is a good in incentive. And with this, I come back to this aspect of also providing incentives uh, to consumers, for example. Uh, so to all, all in all have an incentive-based uh, or incentive-compatible uh, regulatory uh, system uh, addressing all players uh, in, a, in, a, in, in the same direction, so to speak, and, and taking the, their roles, defining their roles uh, ex ante. Uh, so uh, that, I think that is, uh, that is a very important uh, part uh, here. Um, and of course, these are also questions uh, then that refer to whether there is a, let's say, a, that whether there can be a con role conflict, for example, with this consumer-owned uh, DSO. Does this work uh, uh, for energy communities? There are some questions there. I just highlight them just to also show that I think the, um, the, the book describes uh, the very, very clearly and in a very uh, good manner uh, all the um, aspects. Uh, I think the challenge, uh, the, 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 the proof comes when we have to implement all this. Uh, and I hope I have outlined uh, some of the aspects uh, that are important for regulators uh, to get it right. And also uh, to the, the role, the new role uh, or the enhanced role uh, of regulators uh, as promoters of the energy regulation. And maybe as a last sentence, I would like to say that um, I think that this, as I also already mentioned, is on its way already. So we have an evolutionary approach rather than a revolutionary approach. Yeah? Of course, there are locked in effects, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I think nonetheless, the important thing is that the, the change of mind setting of understanding regulation uh, as, a, as a dynamic, uh, in a dynamic way or as a dynam in a dynamic role. I think that's uh, maybe that's it for for now. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yeah. 
Thank you, Anna Gret. And thank you also for, um, for instance, referring to this chapter three on consumer ownership, because indeed you only got a teaser today of two chapters, but this is a book with nine chapters. And as Anna Gret said, there is really a lot of interesting uh, things to read there. Ulrich is asking in the last question, um, can you send me the book once more? Well, we I think we can put the link there once more because we put it all at the beginning, but maybe it's also nice to have it um, as a reminder. Um, um, I also take the opportunity very quickly to ask um, a question that maybe Tim and or Anagret can pick up. So we have Ulrich that asked, um, are we not, should we not pay more attention to new players? Because don't we maybe think that new players are the ones that are going to bring the innovation more than the existing players? And connected to that is a comment by Thomas who also says like, should we not, you know, instead of focusing a lot of monopoly innovation, uh, focus more on other types of innovation. And Claire, maybe related to that, would like to know um, how about public-private partnerships? Um, any thoughts on that? Maybe, Anagret, you, you want to go first? Yeah, and then I, I'll... I can take the, the question uh, uh, that <clears throat> uh, relates to, is it only um, utilities that innovate? Uh, certainly not. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, we, we need to uh, have, the, uh, have an incentive uh, for all um, players uh, and all actors uh, to, uh, to, uh, to innovate uh, and uh, that um, also then uh, applies to, to uh, non-utility, so to speak. Um, and I uh, also would like to say in this context uh, that um, there are, of course, already a number of uh, regulatory tools on how to deal with co uh, costs for R&D, but also for other types of, uh, of innovation. Uh, a key question, however, is, of course, whether a, uh, an innovation or a product or service or network that, um, uh, let's say, that results from innovation, from, the, from implementing the innovation, uh, is considered to be um, uh, competitive or has to be regulated. And I would like to give one example, which we also bring in a, in a recently published uh, paper on hydro future hydrogen regulation, and I would like to mention this here. Uh, hydrogen is certainly something that uh, draws a lot of attention right now and can be seen in that sense as an innovation or as a as a um, uh, as a new something new which wasn't uh, which wasn't uh, there so much before. Uh, and uh, what we see is that uh, we need to see uh, how this develops. Uh, so not every um, uh, pipeline that is a hydrogen pipeline uh, currently is, uh, is, uh, is already a, a network that needs regulation. So uh, if we take the system from telecoms regulation, where you have predefined criteria of when regulation should kick in, uh, then you provide the necessary flexibility without taking away the incentive uh, to uh, innovate and to invest, for example, in hydrogen. But uh, we also cl make uh, clear that we think that this is a competitive uh, um, uh, service. And in that sense, then, of course, uh, certain uh, rules of regulation apply, which basically means, uh, according to the concept of unbundling, uh, operators should not own, uh, let's say, electrolyzers uh, or uh, power to gas um, operators. Thank you, Anna Gret. Tim, I can still give you very short the floor because we're almost out of time. And then Peter, I think, also wants to make a short comment. It's hard to come after Anna Gret <laughs> uh, about these, these rules and new players. I think um, what is often said in European regulation is that rules should be proportional. But what it actually means, especially when you talk for big small, new, old players is very much unclear. And sometimes these rules can be real barriers because of like old school thinking, but sometimes they're justified, but then too risky or too costly. And to find the right balance between that, I think this experimentation, uh, which, which I discussed and, and also was touched upon, could, could really help. So that would be my, my minor addition to it. Thank you, Tim. Peter? No, I, I just think that somebody mentioned nuclear uh, as a as a possibility, and um, 
of course there are existing plans and they they are taking into account or taking it out uh, as it is uh, in some countries um, for new plans uh, at least uh, uh, our consideration is that that is an extremely expensive source of energy compared with many others. So, so if you want an, an energy efficient or cost efficient transition, uh, it's hard to see unless there are major innovations in nuclear that we, we should use that. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Karsten, I will allow, allow you to conclude. And also, if you like, because Louis is asking, what about the regulatory sandboxes in Denmark? I don't even know how you would say that in Danish and uh, are they already uh, being discussed or not? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Leonardo. And yes, it's Sandkasse in Danish. Uh, and there, there actually there is Sandkasse in, uh, in the Danish regulation uh, also now, for example, on the tariff uh, area, which we actually think is, is a good idea uh, to so that is a, a possibility to, uh, to to see there in uh, in Denmark, and and just to conclude, I, I want to say uh, there's been a lot of uh, of uh, good thoughts uh, shared here and good ideas uh, and, uh, and and quite good research uh, too, which is uh, inspiring us also to work further on with the developing regulation also in uh, in Denmark and hopefully also in uh, in other European countries uh, uh, too. And and I'm sure, Annegret, that. Uh, we can continue uh, the discussion uh, uh, further on, uh, maybe in SEA and uh, and also bilaterally. And uh, uh, certainly, I would like also to to share our experience with regulating consumer-owned uh, uh, companies with you uh, in uh, comparison to uh, to other kind of uh, um, of uh, companies. We do not see that big difference actually in uh, in those two uh, setups. Uh, but I think what is important here to uh, also to realize is that, of course, as you uh, started out, Peter, we have an important task to find out uh, what kind of regulation will be the best way to support uh, benefit for consumers, uh, but also uh, supporting uh, the transition uh, to, to green uh, energy. And that is uh, the main question here, uh, to have both both sides and, as uh, Annika said, uh, it's a, it's a multi-complex of regulation we, we look into. Uh, but I think we should be realistic also when it comes to not just regulation, but economic regulation, What, uh, how far we can stretch uh, economic regulation. Because the economic regulation, as we see today, it regulates the re relationship between the single consumer and the supplier. And in the, uh, the question about uh, uh, green transition, uh, there's a lot of questions that relates to society and the benefit to society, which may not be the same as the benefit for the single consumer. So there may be other tools that we should have into play uh, to, uh, to make sure of green transition than just the economic regulation of uh, energy companies. And I think that, that we should not be too ambitious about uh, economic regulation of energy economies to so solve the whole problem of green transition in energy uh, sector. And then of course, uh, I have to say in, in the end also that, uh, that the job for the regulator uh, is of course also to uh, have concern on behalf of consumers. Uh, and of course also to, uh, to support uh, green uh, transition. What we should should uh, closely look into is that uh, companies uh, do not get a free lunch here, but get a green lunch, uh, so to say, in the uh, regulation. I, I think that actually is uh, the core of our job in the, in this uh, relationship. And then in, in the final end, I would like to, of course, to thank uh, Peter, Tim, uh, Manuel, for your uh, good thoughts in uh, in today's uh, webinar, uh, and uh, and you, Leo, for for taking us through uh, the whole day. Uh, thank you, Anna Gret, for uh, giving us uh, perspectives from uh, from regulatory thinking uh, in this uh, aspect uh, too. And then, of course, we will we will we will uh, uh, give the next next thoughts uh, into what what uh, issues that can come in the, in the next volume of uh, the anthology. So uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining the webinar today and thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing your, your thoughts. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.